welcome, Don. I feel welcomed. I'll okay. shake your hand. Great. Yeah, even though we've been <laughs> friends for a long time. Yeah. I'm really stoked to be having this interview with you. I feel like ever since I really started to learn more about your story and kind of the journey that you've went through, I feel like the information that you've been able to learn about and the information that you've experienced and the things that you've experienced in your life would give a very interesting and unique insight into what it's like to go through some pretty crazy stuff and you know go through fame and go through heartbreak and go through coming into your deepest truest power so uh i'm stoked to be sitting in with you today and yeah man me too it's been beautiful to get to know you over time especially in this place because you when i first came you talked about the seven rules of bill Gabamba <laughs> and what it's like here yeah. and how it's a diamond factory, how it really makes you speed up your karma and face your stuff and grow into a much greater person. Sure. And in the beginning, I was skeptical. I was coming in with this US ego and seeing a lot of people being vulnerable and judging them like, ah, they're so weak. Look at all these admirable people. Look at all these crazy people. But then with time, I realized, you know, I have my own stuff to unpack, started unpacking it, getting comfortable, being vulnerable, being real, and growing into who I actually am. And then I see you, you know, whether I practice at the juice factory or wherever, and see you after months, see you after a few months, and it's like, this guy's glowing more. This guy's <laughs> leveling up. I'm leveling up. Wow. So it's the same, so same thing for you, man. And, and as we've been discussing in our conversations before, like, this place really makes you deal with your crap mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, if you don't deal with your crap you self-destruct yeah and uh so it's, it's really beautiful to be here i feel very grateful to be here meeting such amazing and interesting people um but i know that your story started very with a very interesting beginning and uh you had mentioned the importance of vulnerability and uh in my discoveries of my life and what i've figured out through reading and meditating and just being alive in general is that authenticity and vulnerability, because I would say they're one and the same, are um, some of the most powerful high vibe energies that you can give off. And in a lot of respects, it scares people away mm -hmm. because the people that aren't emanating, that aren't vibrating, I hate to use that word because it's so, it's so new age. So I hate, dude, I hate, I hate, it, I hate the new age language as such. Yeah, <laughs> but we gotta but use it a little. Yeah, you, you gotta use it for when you need to use it. But, um, when you're emanating at that frequency, it kind of either scares people away or just oh, like a magnet, it just magnetizes them because you're really, I feel like most people are desperately craving to know when that's like because there's so much layers of um, identity or ego or trauma or fear. And uh, I know that you had gone a lot through that in your early journeys when you were first getting started. And so that's sort of where I want to hop into and how your life has transformed over time. And of course, we want to do a little bit of the expose of what was going on in Survivor, because I know that that was pretty wild and I think it's going to be a pretty big <laughs> bombshell for a lot of people. <laughs> There's never ending expose to be done so we can get into a little bit of it. I love it, dude. I'm stoked. I'm stoked for the expose, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's get started. So from my understanding is that you have been watching Survivor for a long time and you just decided to be like, I'm gonna do this, this is, this is what I wanna do. What, what, what initially compelled you to want to do that? Yeah, man, just seeing the concept of the show and how provocative it is and how pioneering it is, I think it's the best concept TV has ever known. And I have views of how that's been handled and how the producers are running the show now. And I think the show succeeds in spite of a lot of what they're doing now, but as a concept, putting strangers on an island, making them depend on each other on one hand to survive together, and on the other hand, play the devil's game, lying mm -hmm. to each other all the time. Mm -hmm. Just fascinating, um, so cool. And so my friend, when I was finishing high school, said, hey, you should watch Survivor. I was bored, I watched Survivor. I just got hooked pretty immediately. And what season was that? Do you remember when you said? Season 19 is the first one I watched, Samoa, which is a, a weird season, a controversial season because it's, just absolutely dominated by this one guy in terms of the edit. He didn't win, but in mm -hmm. terms of the edit and the story, it's pretty much, it's like one of the few seasons that is like told almost exclusively through one person's eyes, this guy Russell. And uh, a lot of fans don't like it, a lot, some fans like it. Just being introduced to Survivor and seeing this guy like 
change the paradigm of the game that was being played. Like he did all these things that hadn't been done before. He, you know, there are idols out there, the community idols. Yeah. He just started looking for idols, even though previously everyone waited for a clue. The clue tells you where to look. He just started looking and would look for hours and found all these idols and just like thought so outside the box. And so I was really captivated by the fact that Survivor is its own world. Like it's showing the building blocks of culture and how people make agreements and work together. And there's such an open space there for someone to just change the paradigm. Mm. I love paradigm shifts. And so I saw that as possible through Survivor. And also, to be honest, there was like a dark side to why I was drawn to it. Like I had a very chaotic childhood. My story doesn't begin with Survivor, obviously. Of course, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my childhood was characterized by a lot of chaos, a lot of manipulation, lying, distrust. And so I saw a show in which distrust and being discerning and manipulating were not only acceptable, but actually sort of celebrated in this show. And the evil side of me just loved that I thought I could go and and be as Machiavellian as I wanted to be and be celebrated for that. Mm -hmm. And it was greatly ironic because I thought I would go as like a strategic mastermind and manipulate everyone. And I ended up actually being pretty vulnerable and not succeeding at manipulating people, but great stuff came from that. So the reason I ran toward Survivor is not what I found. I actually found what I thought I was running away from, like human connection, intimacy, vulnerability. Fascinating. Yeah, but beautiful. Yeah, Yeah, that's really interesting. I never heard it from that perspective. I feel like with every TV show, they had like this illusion of how it's all just comes together, but it's masterfully scripted. And and the way you were describing it to me earlier in the coffee shop, while we were discussing before we decided to actually have the podcast, was really interesting because uh, my mother actually contacted me and was like, how would, how would one actually go about applying and doing well on Survivor? And I'm sure a lot of the people that have listened to or watched Survivor thought about it would be curious as to the insights as to what would actually make you a possible good contestant. And you had some, you had some choice thoughts for me when we were, when we were discussing that. So uh, yeah, why, why don't you open it up? If somebody was actually interested in doing Survivor, what were the recommendations you would give? I know the first recommendation you said was I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, number one, don't yeah. do it. But number two, if you must. Well, what the conversation I remember having was about how to get cast. And yes. my advice about how to get cast is very different, maybe even opposite from my advice of how to be a good player. So mm-hmm. which are you asking now? Dude, everything, man. Just like, mm-hmm. I'm, I want all stones turned and yeah. I'm all it. Yeah. 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 To be a good player, um, well, let's start, with, let's start with the casting first. Because okay. you, you got to get cast in before you become a good player. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, to get cast, um, it is television. So people are very accustomed to seeing extreme things on television, high energy things. This, I'm sort of doing something different with my docuseries and with the content that I'm making. You know, it's very real and maybe uncomfortably so. And it could have that effect of some people being repelled because they're not ready for it or sure. they're being drawn to it. Sure. That's what I'm doing. But what people typically do on TV is... <laughs> and if you're not, <laughs> then people will think it's boring. Sure. Like people might watch this and be like, it's, this is boring. Mm-hmm. Um, my my like way of speaking now is, is actually my way of speaking. It's no longer what I did to get on TV. But what you do to get on TV is you just amp up the energy times five Mm -hmm. like just talk really loud take up a lot of space and just be a loud personality embody it even if it's uncomfortable and weird Mm -hmm. and then it comes across as normal on tv because that's what we're used to so Mm -hmm. like if you're filming an audition tape drinking red bulls before drinking beers before whatever you have to do to be loose and to be super high energy um yeah loose because being funny being organic charismatic is a big part of it I wouldn't say that was a big strength of mine when I was applying. So I saw there were three big things. I studied the casting process because I knew like, all right, I'm a pretty even keel kid. Um, I'm smart, but I'm not like necessarily the guy you would put on TV. So I had to really study how I would approach it to figure out how to get on TV. And the big three things they look for are sex, conflict, and humor. So the sex, conflict, and humor. Yeah. That's it. If you're super hot, then you already have a lot going for you. Mm Um, if you're super funny, that helps a lot. And then conflict. And it's sad, like, that's another thing where I'm sort of departing from my reality TV roots and what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just hunt conflict and cater to people's guttural desire to see mm. shit. But they do. People want to see that. People want to see, you know, the woman on Housewives of New York throwing a prosthetic leg at someone in anger. Like, 
that's what that's what gets people looking and so that's what I really focused on in the casting process for me because I didn't think I would be fat funny and I know I wasn't a male model so I thought if I could just give them the impression I will get in fights with everyone and be a raging asshole then I'll get cast. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, how did you do that? Did you just like show up like a raging asshole or did you did you just say like I'm gonna be an asshole like I want to start fighting with everybody I'm ready to win so like what what did you demonstrate to them in the way that you communicated with them that you would do that? Conceit, contempt, arrogance, entitlement. Mm -hmm. Like, I basically looked for things that actually are in me. Mm. Like, I, it was shadow work in a way. Mm. Uh, because I was looking at things that are my shadows and that are there, but that I normally would suppress and not, like, present to the world. But in this contrived context, it made all the sense in the world to not only, like, lead with these parts, but blow them out of proportion. Mm -hmm. So I found, like, the seed of arrogance, conceit mm -hmm. in me. And I honed in on that and I let it grow like tenfold. Mm -hmm. And then I walked into the room and I was that. Mm -hmm. And they believed it. And it's kind of crazy that they believed it. Like the lower level casting people eventually figured out like, okay, he's putting on a show. He's, he's like studied this, he's gaming us. Mm -hmm. But Jeff and the higher level producers and the people who only met me for like five, 10 minutes in a hotel room and then at CBS, they, they really thought I was that guy. Mm -hmm. And then I got on the island and I was myself and they were really shocked. <laughs> But yeah, I would say like in a nutshell for anyone, figure out what about you would make someone root for you or against you. Neither is better than the other. And against you actually is maybe a little easier to, to do convincingly. And then take those parts of you that are true to you and blow them up. There you go. You know, most people, when they go through the therapeutic process, they either like meditate or they get a therapist. But you can also go on reality television <laughs> and completely project to the world all of your insecurities. <laughs> that works too. Yeah. yeah, it's not the easiest path, and not the one I would recommend. It's certainly ballsy. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I, <laughs> I want to get into kind of the the, the darker side of. Survivor because it seems like it's this very contrived show and everything's everything's all pieced together perfectly But I remember you told me you had some pretty uncomfortable situations with some of the producers or you know with Jeff um, Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Tell me what, what, what happened? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean all of casting was kind of uncomfortable because you're locked in a hotel room for a week mm -hmm. being forced to take psychological tests and going into these interviews that are just weird and progressively weirder like the first ones weren't so weird but by the time i was meeting with jeff and mark burnett um who created the show or i think charlie parsons created the show but the executive producer mark burnett um by the time i had my first interview with them it was yeah i was not at all expecting what i walked into i walked in and it was a little normal for the first minute and then after a minute or so they just started fucking with me basically mm -hmm. and so jeff is like so, when did you realize you were gay? <laughs> and I was like, huh? And they're like, you know, when did you realize you like men? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm not homophobic or anything, but I don't, I don't know where you got the idea that I'm gay. I'm not. Um, what is this? Is this like some weird British humor? Because Mark was there. And they're like, no, 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 just, okay, fine. But if you're not gay, fine. But if you were gay, what size cock would you like? And like, just blown away by this like that this is how professionals are behaving but that's yeah. that's that industry mm -hmm. and um some like big i guess it seems to be what people like and then Tell they you're gone, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah. but yeah they dropped that eventually but yeah they they were just like um they like just throwing a lot of crap at you and seeing how you'll respond they really lean into the grandiosity that they're like the CIA mm -hmm. and they give you an alias I had to check into the hotel with this fake name mm -hmm. and then they take you through airports and all the traveling and you can't talk you're on the lockdown they call it actually it's interesting that it's called that it was like I had this experience of just ultimate submission and like giving up my power to be part of this production before the whole world went through something a little bit like that That's during awesome. the COVID era but they call it lockdown and you can't talk and uh, they, when you're going do, between different locations, they blindfold you and they put tape on the windows of the van so you don't mm -hmm. know where you are. So it's just all of this like surrender to this 
production, which presents itself as benevolent. And like they even said things like when you're out there, the, the producers are like your island therapists, just tell them whatever, you can feel safe with them. Uh, which is a pretty fucked up thing to say, I think, because it's a totally exploitative business yeah, and they're totally. extracting what they need for an entertainment product. Wow. So, so yeah. I just surrendered to that and played the devil's game and got a lot of pain and absorbed a lot of the that you know devil energy. Sure. Um, but learned a lot from it too. So it was very painful, but also very formative. It made me ask the right questions about life and start meditating and really started me on my path in a lot of ways. Yeah, I want to ask a little more about the the whole interview process um, because I know that you had those weird questions that were asked to you. Do you think that they were testing the persona that you were putting on? Yeah. Or do you think that they were more just actually like really weird, creepy people and they were trying to see if you were equally creepy and weird? <laughs> you know, like, is this guy really creepy and weird like us? You know? It could be a little bit of that. I mean, I, I was friends with people in production and there were like production assistants who said the first time they met Jeff, like, second sentence out of his mouth after hello was, uh, so what do you guys think about anal bleaching? And just put stuff like that out there and see how people respond. Sounds, sounds like, uh, <laughs> sounds not like what Jeff would say online you know, or on. No, no, no. Again. Yeah. That's yeah. not on the final cut of the yeah. family show survivor. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's, I think it's partly that industry and those people, um, a lot of darkness there a lot of just like fucking with you energy like mm -hmm. liking to fuck with people and mm -hmm. see how they respond but that is useful i see why they do it practically for casting because sure. casting is all about i mean they're trying to cast people who have egos like mm -hmm. ego is what is entertaining on mm -hmm. tv Most definitely. and in life i would say sure. like i've become more feminine and more awake as mm -hmm. i've worked with ayahuasca for example mm -hmm. and a consequence of that is becoming a little more boring like I'm not really a character. I don't have a shtick. I don't mm -hmm. walk around like this is who I am and, and performing that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've leaned much more into presence than in performance. Mm -hmm. And TV thrives on performance, the ego. And uh, so it is very useful for them to say something that would shock an ego and see how strong the ego is to see like how the ego responds. And mm -hmm. I stuck to my guns. I stuck to like the, the person I was being and I wasn't really phased, mm -hmm. which I think was pretty rare for someone at at the time, I was 19 or 20, 20. Um, typically older people have bigger egos and the reason they don't cast as many young people is their egos are less developed, they're more malleable, they're more willing to change their opinions. Mm -hmm. So I realized I had to counter that and I went in with super strong opinions, like acting like I had these deep, big political views that mm -hmm. I kind of had, but I was really just like playing it up. You're playing it up, yeah. And yeah, so I had to like stick with it. And so I get why they, they do those things because they're trying to see like how strong is your ego and what will happen if we throw you to the wind? Because that's what Survivor is in a way. It's just being thrown into this crazy, unknown, contrived situation and seeing mm -hmm. how you respond. Because it seems like it seems like a lot of it's contrived when you look at it from behind the scenes. How much of it is it actually you legitimately surviving? It is legit. I mean, they're not giving you sandwiches behind the cameras. Mm -hmm. It's not scripted, and they it is legit. Uh, in just about all the ways um, the producers do like leave you in a convenient situation like where i was in the philippines and cambodia i don't think there naturally would just be a bunch of bamboo lying around mm -hmm. ready to be used for a shelter mm -hmm. so they do you know throw a little bamboo like drop some coconuts like sure. we, we called them the coconut fairies like if we were, <laughs> if we were like really thirsty and suffering and suddenly there would be a few coconuts like oh look at that <laughs> so they hook you up yeah. but they they do let you starve also they mm -hmm. they like put you in a situation where you'll be fine it's not naked and afraid you know it's mm -hmm. the people there would not last on a show like naked and afraid mm -hmm. um but it is real insofar as you're going without and other than just like the little bones they throw you um you are surviving mm -hmm. interesting Interesting. Interesting. I wanted to go back a little bit to what we were talking about with putting on the persona. I have a little bit of a change of heart when it comes to persona. I feel like when we do a lot of deep and inner spiritual work, there is this push to getting rid of the ego or the ego is the enemy or, or, and then you get to the point of, okay, well, the ego is not actually bad and you have to integrate the ego. It's an important part of who you are. And if you didn't have your ego, then you wouldn't be able to differentiate yourself from this camera from you right um when i as as you know but a lot of our viewers don't know i, I work with uh, professional men and helping them meet their goals and with their relationships and stuff but i've also worked with couples to women in the past and i had a very interesting client one time who came to me 
And she, she asked me to do the complete opposite. She said, I already know who I am very deep, deeply and authentically, but I want to cultivate a persona. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting because mm-hmm. I had never, <laughs> I had never thought that somebody would deliberately want to make up a made up character that they play. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was such a unique concept because there's so many people that are on this healing journey, like you said, and change a lot to become a lot more relaxed and not so big into your ego or the idea of who Spencer Bledsoe was. Um, but I, I can also sense some deep power in the ability to really play a role. Because deep down inside, you know you're just playing a role. And, but the opposite end is if you're playing so deeply and authentically who you are, isn't that also playing a role, like a very unique character yourself? Mm-hmm. Just as much as you can develop this persona about yourself, like Marilyn Monroe or whatever, or even someone like Donald Trump, he's definitely playing a character, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But he knows he's really good at playing the Donald. And, yeah. he, and he is a master. A master. I mean, I, I don't have, I, I don't swing any political. I'm apolitical, but I, I give credit where credit's due. He is a master of getting energy to him. And yeah. if there's one thing about getting money, getting power, it's about how much energy can you amass. Mm-hmm. And he is a master of transmuting negative energy into positive energy and vice versa. As there's nothing, what is it? What is and vice it? versa. Okay. There's, there's no bad press. Right? As yes, said. yes. He ma- he's a master of the media yeah. of, in a lot of ways, communication. Totally. I, I agree with you. I give credit where credit's due. Yeah. I don't know if he, I, I wouldn't say he's like very conscious. I don't think Donald no. Trump could stop playing Donald Trump if he wanted to. Sure, I, I get it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I, maybe he's not as such a good, a good idea or as an example. But no, but he, as a communicator, handling communications, understanding the energy of a conversation, of an exchange, like with the media, mm-hmm. dominating the space in the conversation, mm-hmm. he is a master of that. Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with either cultivating your ego or being authentic. I think they're sort of one and the same. It's, it, this is an interesting concept that I want to play with you because I have never actually talked about this particular thing before and this is something I sort of want to unpack. It's, if you want to go on television, you have to play this ego yourself, right? I think of someone, I don't know, like maybe I'm dating myself, but like Snooki, for example, <laughs> you know, like, or, or something like that. Anybody yeah. that's got a big personality yeah. is obviously going to draw a lot of attention to themselves. Now, there's a difference if they consciously are playing that and they know they're playing that role versus that they actually think that they're that role themselves. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess it's just sort of a tool in your master pocket of, of ways to play things. But as you mentioned in the earlier in the coffee shop when we were talking that I thought was very interesting was that you said to me that you were one of the only people, at least in your opinion, in, in Survivor that, that got out of Survivor without um, survive, survivor. I had to say, sorry. <laughs> without losing it, without making that their identity. Because you said a lot of people at Left Survivor, they said that's, that's the apex of their life. Like that happened 15 years ago, and yet you're, they go on interviews and they're still talking about Survivor, and that's it. And uh, so, what do, you, what do you think about that in terms of overcoming that or? how you were able to overcome that yourself. Because I know that you said that that was very challenging mm-hmm. for you in, in your transition from being this popular, famous character on Survivor and to get with the fame. And can, can you tell me a little bit about how you dealt with the fame and how that changed your psychology? Yeah. Uh, first, I want to clarify that the fame was a very low level, small taste of fame in the big picture of TV and film. But it was enough of a taste to know that it sucks, that it's not actually good or healthy for anyone, even if it feels really good at the time, which it did. It was a huge rush. The dopamine rushes of like after an episode scrolling through Twitter and seeing thousands of people commenting on my personality, mm-hmm. 95% positive, loving me or loving who they think I am. Mm-hmm. But then it's interesting how the negative outweighs the positive. We look for that. You look until you find the shit and then that bothers you. And then you look for more good stuff to build up this false ego. It's just a terrible, um, destructive cycle. So how, so how would you feel about that? Like, I really want to get into the feelings of what that felt like. Did you feel yeah. like you were God? Did you feel like, I don't know, like, cause I've never had that kind of experience before mm-hmm. where I'm high on this people getting high on somebody that I'm not like, that sounds like a very weird situation that I've never experienced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have a few more places I want to go. Cause you said a lot. Sure. Last, I don't leave so, you. I don't, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just, 
trying to figure out the path through these topics. I love these topics. This is good questions and good stuff to talk about because it relates so far beyond just Survivor or just TV. Yeah. I think in general, in the world where we are now, there is this intense narcissistic energy that has colonized the globe. And technology has been a vehicle for it to do that. TV has been a huge vehicle for it to do that. Hollywood has colonized the minds of the world. You know, people watching Disney Channel, whether they're in the US or here, people watching all this stuff dreamed up in Southern California or in the US, and it's spread everywhere around the globe. And it's artifice, you know, but it is power also. And it's like masculine power like these cameras, these boom mics, all these phallic things, you know, they're just like penises, like spreading energy all around the world. If you were gay, Spencer. <laughs> if I were gay, I would, How many boom mics? I would have my lips wrapped around a big boom mic. Yeah. Uh, this, okay, so I think, I think there's, <laughs> there's masculine power and there's feminine power. And masculine power is relative. It's worldly power. It's the power of action, the tangible, the material. Feminine power is like what I'm touching when I'm touching ayahuasca. It's horizontal. It destroys the ego. You know, you go into the presence of deep feminine power and there's no space for your ego. Like my first ayahuasca ceremony in Ecuador, it was interesting actually, 20, 30 minutes before around the campfire, someone brought up Survivor and I, I always kind of like, I had a lot of resistance at that time to when this happens. I still do a little bit, like it's annoying when like, it's brought up and a lot of people don't know about it and then it comes to dominate the conversation. People are like, oh wow, how was that? And I hear the same questions I've heard 10,000 times. Sure, of course. Yeah. At no fault of the people, but it's just, you know, I've been through this tens of thousands of times. I get it, yeah. And so that happened like 30 minutes before this ceremony. And then the ceremony was by a hundredfold or more the hardest experience of my life, mm. including starving on Survivor, including all the hard ceremonies. I've drunk mm. ayahuasca 57 times. I've had a lot of experiences. Right this was the hardest and it's not even close. The next hardest thing would be 1% as hard. Mm -hmm. And so it was an experience of just getting obliterated, like my male ego being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so Survivor was brought up before this and it was also an intense time, January, 2021. I had just heard about the insurrection in the US and um, now we're living through an insurrection here. Um, and so that was on my mind. I didn't know what was going to be happening with the world. Everything seemed in chaos. I was dealing with my ego. My ego was being flared up and brought up in a conversation. I went into the ceremony and just got destroyed. Mm -hmm. And that was like a big taste of what feminine power is and uh, a hard thing to go through as a man, but I went through it and I'm stronger for it. And so I think like there's a, a deep truth in that. It brings you to presence. It brings you to unity consciousness. We're all one. Mm -hmm. And that's beyond man and woman. That's just oneness. But um, yeah, that's like the truth. And people spend so much time seeking the truth, trying to deconstruct the ego and get to the truth. And you do have to do that. Because mm -hmm. like if I had just stayed going the way I was going before all these experiences, meditating with plant medicine, I would probably be dead now. I would have a heart attack or I would be putting content out there that's just terrible and not realizing it's terrible that would be not self-aware mm -hmm. and uh, i think like the self-awareness is the key because like through this process of deconstructing the ego becoming self-aware realizing i'm nothing i'm actually in a similar spot to like your friend that you mentioned like i'm now at a phase where i've gotten to baseline i have you know at least enough awareness and awakeness to to feel comfortable doing this now i'm ready to be someone again you know, after being no one, I'm ready to build up a character, but to do it consciously. And I guess that's always been like a little bit of a quality. Like when I was on Survivor, I do think I was, I mean, in casting, certainly I was aware of the character I was playing. I did have blind spots and lacks of lacking self-awareness in a lot of ways. But yeah, I was one of the few people who is there knowing why they're there. They cast people who are big personalities and will cause waves and either know exactly why they'll be entertaining or have no clue, no mm -hmm. self-awareness. And 90% of the time, it's no clue, no self-awareness, because mm -hmm. that's more effective, that's easier to exploit. Mm -hmm. And also 90% of the time, people go on the show and they believe the character that was shown, they believe in this masculine power, and they attach to that and they cling to that. And it's really sad, man. Like mm -hmm. I've met people who have been on the show, I met a guy who was on the show season seven and 16. So the last time he was on the show was literally uh, 15 years ago. And to this day, 
he's telling his stories about his time on the island. He's he told me the same stories multiple times, not even remembering that he told the same story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's all a performance. They're all performance. They're all masculine energy. They have no contact with the feminine, which mm -hmm. is a lot of where the world is at, especially in a place like the U.S. and in these industries. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was a rarity in that I always had a strong feminine side. I always had this like contact with spirit. And I did what I had to do to play a character to get on and did the shadow work of that and then grew in self-awareness and now I'm like in a different place. Um, but yeah, I think what's most powerful is the integration of masculine and feminine power. And that's what makes humans so powerful. That's why like that combination of these two divine loves is the most powerful force, I think, maybe in the universe. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's, it, it's been so essential for me to go into my feminine in order to regrow the masculine. Because I do think like if these parts of humanity are a tree, the feminine, uh, this works. The yeah. feminine is the roots. The feminine is the base. And you can always grow something good on top of that. But if that's not there, if that's not good, this is just a mess. Mm -hmm. This is World War III. This is look at the world. Mm -hmm. But if you regrow this, then you can be growing this character from authenticity. Mm -hmm. And you'll always miss the mark a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like everything I say on some level is bullshit. And I'm always like a little bullshitting. But that's also the fun of the ego and the points. Like we're here to experience something rather than nothing. And that's why we need ego and masculine energy and masculine power. And if you, that power can be aligned with the feminine and grow in that alignment, that's when it's the most powerful. Mm -hmm. And that's why I felt powerful as I've started doing this project, as mm -hmm. I've started bringing this masculine energy to this place, which has such a strong feminine base. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as we've talked about here, like, there is a space to bring in some masculine energy and to get things done because this is a place where things don't always get done and where people don't know about this place and i'm here to expand this place and to help people know about this place and i believe that was long-winded so thanks for your patience no no it's, it's it's all very interesting um there's lots of um lots of things to unpack with when you say masculine and feminine energies because to a lot of people perhaps people that are watching this that, that kind of sounds like woo-woo and people can get lost on that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting the way that you perceive masculine and feminine energy from, from myself because I, I sort of look at it as like there's wounded masculine energy and there's wounded feminine energy. And that with, with you know, men are primarily in a masculine energy and women and vice versa. And that when they are met with the respective, healthy, integrated level of that, it shines light on our woundedness and then helps them lift up and integrate. So the so for you, perhaps, um, you felt wounded masculine and then a healthy feminine helped you integrate your healthy masculine. Vice versa, for me, I was way too much in my feminine energy when I was younger and then I stepped into my masculine power learning that I gotta build this dream myself. Like I gotta make things happen. Ain't nobody gonna come save me. I gotta be responsible. I gotta be radically authentic. I gotta be radically in integrity with myself. No lying to myself completely. So I sort of went the opposite way and having a healthy integrated masculine energy in my life helped me elevate myself to sort of that equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it really depends on which way you're looking at it from. Yeah. Right? Because if, if you, you got the leaves but no roots, you, you ain't gonna last much longer. But if you got roots and no leaves, then what's the product of your work? Yeah. Right? Yeah, totally. And, and it doesn't have to be like all one and all the other. I do think there's a lot to be said for going in or reflecting, being still mm -hmm. cultivated in that feminine presence and then doing something, trying and sure. seeing how it goes. You can always go back, back and forth, back and forth. So um, moving, moving in from the, the wounding that happened on Survivor and moving into the process of the integration, why that's happening. Yeah, oh, no, I remember what I was going to say. Um, just that you were talking about being too emotional, and that's where I've been at too. But I would say it's not necessarily being too emotional. It's being too, um, too reactive to your emotions. Because I feel a lot, bro, and I think you do too. Sure. Like, uh, but I also have a lot of masculine energy, and I can comport myself and feel all of it, and still do what I'm doing regardless. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think is the most powerful. And uh, and yeah, it's really been that zigging and zagging journey big zigs and zags you know i went into the belly of the beast and like some of the mo like one of the most masculine spaces in the world being on a tv show and then i had all this energy but it was going in stupid directions and so i needed to connect with the feminine to um to correct it mm -hmm. and uh, it was because of what survivor is that i realized the need to do that like 
you're not eating, you're facing yourself, you're not used looking at screens, you're on the screen, but you're not looking at screens and you're just being, a lot of it is letting time pass. Like mm -hmm. if you don't have a challenge that day, back in the day, now they have it shorter, but like there were off days and those were the worst because you're just like sitting there watching the sun go across the entire sky all day, mm -hmm. nothing to, to do other than talk, other than relate to people and face people and then face yourself. And so with all the introspection and asceticism of not eating and talking to people and being in this environment, I realized a lot about myself and I realized like the ego that I thought I had together at the time was really not together. It was really not what I thought it was. And you know, at 21, 21 year old male, come on, that's like the, the height of bravado without the real strength. That's the, <laughs> that's the height of, you know, just uh, BS. And uh, and so that's where I was, but because I had this experience not eating and being with myself after, I don't know, 15, 20 days, um, repressed emotions came up and emotions came up. And like, I didn't think I was emotional at all. I thought I was just like a cold, calculated guy, but I realized my emotional nature and my feminine nature because of the situation. And um, I remember like a big catalytic experience was at the merge feast my first season like after when you merge you get a lot of food and mm -hmm. I was eating all this food which was amazing after not eating hardly anything just a little rice for whatever 18 days and I was struck by this strong emotion of guilt that came upon eating the food like they pulled me for an interview and they were like how are you doing and I'm like it's amazing to eat but like I I don't know why but I, I feel like guilty mm -hmm. And I realized, you know, there's this deep sense of shame, this deep sense of guilt mm -hmm. that I had carried with me. And that tuned me into my inner child and to the wounds that were there that were really just uh, stuffed under the rug of this bravado and this ego and whoever I thought I was. So what was the guilt coming from exactly? Did you ever pan that out? Did you ever hash that out? Uh, deep things from birth. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, as that came, I had a memory come of when I was eight and I got a really nice marble chess set as a gift for my birthday. And then that night I was looking at it and thinking, wow, this is so nice. And then feeling really sad and crying and just feeling unworthy of it, feeling mm -hmm. guilty. And yeah, I think it's from childhood stuff. It's mm -hmm. like if the world we came into is something like mm -hmm. born in a hospital. That's something in itself. But then, you know, 24 hours of labor, traumatic birth, emergency C-section, mm -hmm. One of my early experiences is having part of my dick chopped off, as happens to guys in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So very traumatic entry to the world. And then my mom had her trauma, deep trauma, you know, more intense stuff. And, you know, everything passes on. That's what karma is. So yeah. things passing through the generations, she felt unworthy and like a piece of shit. So she made me feel unworthy and like a piece of shit at no fault of her own. But that's it's what was transmitted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's unconscious, yeah. And my dad, you know, in, in the way he moved through the world was a little bit of a piece of shit in a lot of ways. He's a great man and I love my dad and very inspired by him. But like as far as uh, racism, sexism, just kindness toward people, like I was absorbing a culture that I now understand I chose to go into to deal with all this stuff. But I was absorbing a culture that just felt very shameful. And I had this deep sense from the beginning of my life that like uh, that I'm unworthy. And I think a lot of us have that. So that came up in survivor and when that That's came really up i'm like yeah. Yeah. i'm like this is something to work on i started asking questions about life and what i'm doing and realized you know i don't really want to just you know down the road realize i don't just want to stay in finance and make money there's no real good end game there i want to give something to the world that only i can give to the world mm -hmm. which is very masculine mm -hmm. so it, it was also like as i was getting more connected and more feminine i was getting more masculine the two went together sure. so yeah. that's when i wanted to do a podcast that's when i wanted to do creative work as a living which i'm doing now and uh, and meditate yeah so i started meditating and had some deep meditative experiences and upon having those experiences i realized just how profound spiritual work can be and i went on retreats and just deeper 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 mm -hmm. yeah i feel like anybody that's done the inner work or knows what that's like or has gone to the healing journey has had that one really groundbreaking experience it could be a memory it could be maybe like a psychedelic experience or something that they're gonna they think they're gonna have fun and take like acid and go to a party but then they have these deep realizations or something and yeah i feel like especially at this day and age now there's millions and millions of people that are feeling their soul called to a higher purpose and that's 
having these kinds of conversations is now not weird. It's actually more normal, which I think is great. I think it's important to really get authentic in a world that feels like it thrives on inauthenticity. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, um, and, and to bring authenticity to the very part of that world that most thrives on inauthenticity yeah. and on artifice, which is yeah. TV, social media, what yeah. we put out there. Well, that was the one thing that I found extremely interesting in the work that I do with men, because I, I work with some men that have like, private equities, and they do, they do a private equity, they, they do lots of stuff, and they're very successful in what they do. But they're struggling, like deeply struggling, and they're they have alcohol problems or sex addiction or whatever. And I, I realized that in that limelight, in that success, they have what I call the veneer of success, but internally they're just like dying inside because society has conditioned them to saying, okay, you have to have this external experience, you have to have this bank account, you have to have this type of woman, you have to have this type of in order for you to qualify to be whatever. And what I find is that the more that they accumulate, that society tells them they need to be, the emptier that they feel. And that it's kind of interesting because what I, I call it seeking the capstone. So when you seek the highest point of your actualization, your your highest good, your highest authenticity, your, your highest excitement, your highest truth, your highest vulnerability, your highest expression of yourself, all of the stuff the base of the pyramid builds itself. You get the connections, you get the experiences, you get the money, you get the relationships, you get everything you want, but you ultimately realize that that's not actually what I want. I want this connection to God and a higher power and, and my authentic expression. And to me, it's so interesting because I'll work with guys and they'll be like, why do, why do women only value me for my status or my money? And I'm like, well, are you meeting with your status and your money? Because that's their highest, that's, the, that's what they think is the most important, or that's what they value the most in themselves. So they lead with that. Mm. And then naturally, you're going to attract women that are all anxious in those things. And mm -hmm. vice versa, you know, I have talked to some women, they're like, why do you guys only think about one thing? I'm like, well, are you leading with your sexuality? And then they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, that's why they only value you for that. And, um, it's interesting because underneath all of this bravado or whatever, you know what I mean? Bravado is, um, is that deep core authenticity that I think that you are pointing to and experiencing, which needs to go through the healing process. Uh -huh. But I would argue that the healing process isn't necessarily always feminine energy. Yeah. Um, healthy masculine energy also is equally as healing and equally as authentic as well. And I think it just goes with the respective polarities, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, often in my mind, I do this thing where I like, there are all these polarities and I associate different polarities with different things. And there's a reason for that. It's not based on nothing, but it's like, okay, feminine, earth, centrality, emotions, mm -hmm. masculine, sky, decentralization, intellect. Right. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's crossover world sure. of both. And obviously both can be authentic, I think, just in different facets. So totally. like the feminine feels more authentic in terms of ego transcendence mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. The masculine feels more authentic in terms of being the ego, which is authentic. Mm -hmm. Like people who are spiritual say, this is an illusion, this isn't real, time mm -hmm. isn't real. And it's like, okay, yeah, time's a construct, but so are you, so are words, so yeah. what are you saying? Yeah. yeah, this is an illusion, but we're experiencing it. Our experience sure. of this is very real. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so yeah, both are essential and important. I, I wanted to bring that up because I feel like maybe a lot of the people that would be watching this video are still sort of not really understanding the, the facets and the nuances of these expressions of these energies. And they, mm -hmm. when they think feminine, they think a woman. Or, yeah. you know, and, and not really understanding all of the shamanic or the psychological or the Jungian or the symbolic representations of everything that it could represent mm -hmm. in its totality. So yeah. that's sort of why I'm trying to break it down a little bit to, to get at the nuances, because I agree with you in, in terms of that. But um, And that's what tallies in all of us. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important thing to clarify, because so often femininity and masculinity are conflated with mm -hmm. women and men, and that couldn't be more untrue in today's world. Mm -hmm. Like, as I say, there is this masculine energy, this kind of destructive masculine energy that has colonized everything, mm -hmm. including women. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's weird, I think, because women are receptive 
they often take on more of it. Mm -hmm. Like when I see the older generation, the one generation above us, mm -hmm. I look at like a six-year-old woman and a six-year-old man, the six-year-old woman actually seems more damaged by this narcissism that's spread everywhere. It's mm -hmm. hurt her feminine and she's become estranged from her feminine because mm -hmm. she was grew up in a world that focuses so much on the surface that she thought, and feminism probably reinforced this belief, that the way to be empowered is to be a better man than men can be, to yeah. channel their masculine energy. So yeah. I see a lot of women of this generation, and it's really tragic, who are just like, talk, 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 zero ability to listen, all masculine energy, their feminine is just asleep. Mm -hmm. And a lot of men's feminine are asleep yeah. too. Um, but yeah, it's like, all of it is in all of us. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, there's a war on humanity, and you get snapshots of it with media or with, um, social media or TV and stuff like with the survivor because they, as they, as we were saying earlier, you, they kind of lionize the ego and um, they downplay the authenticity. But I would say that people are starved for authenticity. People are dying and desperate for it. And I, and I really think that that's <clears throat> the direction of the new economy that we're moving towards. It's not about buy one and get another one or false scarcity or ego or any of that there, there's going to be some people that resonate with that but as time goes on and people really get a taste of what it feels like to be integrated or to speak with truth or conviction or authenticity that that's that's a frequency that people really resonate with that that's actually where you get the word charismatic from i, I was learning about this the other day it's really interesting um the charisma if, if you have charisma that means you have the spirit and so this is where we get like the charismatic movement from religions and stuff. And mm -hmm. you would read the Bible, for example, and you would have these great leaders like Moses and they would say that he has the spirit, that when that person spoke, people really resonated with what they had to say. So it's, so charisma means being able to speak with the spirit of conviction. Mm -hmm. And that comes, that's so magnetizing. And I feel like as we have these conversations and you're really just opening up and exposing yourself and reality and, and what's going on, people are either going to be really scared of it or really gravitate towards it. And it's sort of creating this bifurcation in the world where the more and more people that are waking up the truth of themselves, um, the less this false reality is going to be part of our life. Like, I, I can't even think of the last time I watched TV. Someone's like, somebody asked me the other day, do you want to come over and watch TV? I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just like, you have a TV? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. it was so weird to me. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I yeah. love living in this bubble where it's yeah. weird to have a TV. <laughs> yeah. Well, like your TV. <laughs> TV, I mean, I have a computer and sometimes I watch TV on there, but I, I only watch stuff that I think is by someone who's a genius mm -hmm. or something really high quality because I do think so like Survivor. <laughs> if, if Survivor, if I were the producer of Survivor, then yeah, but sure, sure. as it is now. <laughs> I think TV and film and this new manifestation of something like reality TV can be a huge part of what we're co-creating because it can show what's possible. And I remember like Eckhart Tolle said something like this, like generally TV, these things, they're turning you into a zombie, their low consciousness, but in certain forms with something like Black Mirror that exposes people to a lot of uncomfortable truths mm -hmm. or something like Light and Shadows that shows people great possibilities as well as difficult things. Like if you're showing reality and expanding consciousness through it, then it's great. It's a great tool for our evolution. Before we took a break, I, I wanted to ask him a question, uh, which is a really interesting concept. I think I know what your answer will be, but I want to just check anyway. So we were talking about, through this conversation, this theme of authenticity and going through the, the devil's belly, as I think you said, the devil's under route, um, and thriving in your ego and, and leaving to play that persona. So my thought process was, maybe this is not really a good idea, but I remember one of my favorite characters on Survivor when I watched the show, well, I don't watch it anymore, but when I was watching it when I was younger, was a Rupert. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, say what you will about him, but from what I recall, him, he was just really charismatic. And it, it, it appeared that he was being authentic. Now, I don't know if he was, I don't know if that was just really good editing or whatever, but the, the reason I bring that up is because imagine if you actually were really deeply, just authentically yourself on TV, so authentic 
to the point of where it actually was compelling. And I wonder how people, I wonder how the producers would react to that, but I also wonder how the audience would react to that. And so I know people have asked you to go back. They've been asking you, I know you have, and I know you're like, no, I've never done that again. Yeah. But I'm wondering, to speculate, given the knowledge that you know now, given the integration that you know now, given the awakenings and the authenticity that you found in yourself, do you think that if you actually went back on the show again with the authentic self that you are now, that you would actually blow stuff out of the water and really actually be able to speak to the audience? on a deeper level that they would resonate with. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think I would be able to, but I think that is far from the best way to accomplish those goals. Mm. Like I do want to use my voice and reach people, but I think what I'm doing is actually a much more powerful way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like it is interesting how to pick it up with Rupert. Mm -hmm. I think he's an example of a guy who was a very compelling character because he was so in the character that he wasn't even in touch with his authentic self at all. Um, interesting. Just, yeah. He was the character. And I think yeah. that's, I haven't met him, so I don't want to judge too much. Sure. But my impression is like just in everyday life, like a lot of people who have been on the show, they're mm -hmm. stuck in the character. Mm -hmm. um, but no, he was hamming it up also. I'm sure he's not always that like loud. Um, but yeah, I think all good. Okay. She just did this. <laughs> That's not what you want to see from your producer. <laughs> oh, do over. No, no. There's a camera. Okay. She's asking you to tell me where the batteries are. Okay. So I'll be in. I'm mostly this place. Rupert. Yeah, characters. People get stuck in characters. And it's interesting how it goes full circle where like the characters are compelling and entertaining, but if you do go all the way down to the roots of the authenticity, that can be compelling too, but only in long form, only if you give it the space it needs, and that's the mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. An episode of Survivor is taking 72 hours of you and condensing it into one to two minutes of confessionals if you're a huge character, two to three minutes mm -hmm. of content. So that film to air ratio is staggering, mm -hmm. bigger even than what my film to air ratio will be with what I'm doing. Um, and so you just, it, it appeals, it naturally appeals to the sound bites, to the surface. Um, there's just not space for the depth. Mm -hmm. Like there's space for the depth in a long form interview like this. There's space for the depth if you really give it time and if you, if you really are thoughtful of how you create you know, a documentary episode. But in Survivor, not really. And, and yeah, I think I would probably be good and compelling for the producers and for the audience but I think yeah it's just like no interest really I would if that were the best way for me to reach people and accomplish my goals I would I'm not like anti-survivor but I think there's no chance because I just think there's sure. no chance it'll be the way to do it like I have a voice that I can use now independently not yeah. through the filter of what they choose to put in an edit and just to deal with being treated like a third grade child brought through airports blindfolded put in lockdown um, and and to to deal with the people to to not eat and do that to my body again it just seems in no way worth it given i can do what i want to do without it that makes perfect sense yeah but it's cool i mean i would say like it hurts more people than it helps and that's why my initial advice is don't do it but it's cool like if you make the most of it i think it's what you make of it it's a, an amazing opportunity for for introspection for growth for a peak experience and the danger is just you don't want it to become the peak experience of your life that you cling to because that's you at a time mm -hmm. and then you get attached to you at that time and mm -hmm. to your image that's created from this time and people stop growing as humans yeah. because they're living in that living in the past yeah one one mantra that i say to myself is that i'm always peaking like i never stop peaking yeah up and up like 20s, my 20s was a peak, and now I'm just gonna peak again. My 30s and my 40s, and I'm just keep peaking and peaking and peaking. And I think that kind of mindset is necessary to really actually live a full life experience, and such as what you're doing yourself. And you're going on the journey, you're buying land in Ecuador, you're working on yourself, you're creating docu series to really make a difference and an impact. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think of those people that peaked in high school, and I have this like, oh, yeah, that sucks. I that sucks. I with those people. <laughs> well, actually, I, I don't because they choose. Yeah, true. they choose their life. True. And they, I was jealous of them in high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's what's funny? 
I look back on my high school, I never fit in in my high school. I just, I would wander around and be like, I don't get these people. Like, yeah. These people are weird to me, and now they're all just like sitting at home selling life insurance, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, all right, bro, like, mm-hmm. I've been living my life and doing interesting things, and I mean, you know, this is not to make me feel good about myself, but it's... This it was, is to show them, and then... Well, show them that you won. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even that. It's, it's 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 really it's really more along the lines of finding your deepest authentic purpose, and that's sort of why I wanted to tie this whole interview home with was starting with what got you compelled on the journey, what what motivated you, those darker aspects of yourself, the healing, the overcoming, and then the coming into yourself, and then now the actualization process, and tying it all home is that. You know, you, you could have claimed that you peaked in Survivor. You could have done that, but you chose to make something more of it. And I think that that's a testament for any other part of your life. Maybe if you were a high school jock or you were the school president of God knows whatever in college or whatever, yeah. that you choose to continue, continually climb more exciting mountains. Mm-hmm. That, yeah. and, and that's until the day you die. And that's what's exciting about being a human is that there's so much more to explore and unpack. Yeah. yeah, resonate with that deeply. It's so important. Always another mountain. And every mountain's a trap or a potential trap to get stuck and to identify with that plateau. Stand on there and say you're the king of the hill, mm-hmm. but you're going down eventually. So you might as well go up and down and up and down and more and more up and have a new mountain. Mm-hmm. And anything can be that. Like this can be that. You yeah. know, I moved on from Survivor, but creating a docuseries that changes the world and being a face of light and shadows, that could easily be somewhere I get stuck also. Mm-hmm. So I won't get stuck there, you know, I'll do that and then I'll go on some other journey and maybe it'll get like more esoteric, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll focus, there'll be a new chapter of focusing on spirituality. It's mm-hmm. like the inner journey is what I was on for a while, now I'm doing some outer things and mm-hmm. maybe I'll go back in. But yeah, whatever it is, in, out, wherever it's facing, it's so important to always have another mountain. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's what we, live for and what keeps us growing and keeps our spirit alive. Like as soon as we're just going through the motions, selling life insurance or whatever, we're dying. And um, that is a lot of people. But um, but yeah, it was a blessing in a lot of ways that I was at the bottom of the totem pole in high school. Like mm-hmm. no girls liked me, gave me any attention. I had self-worth on the floor, mm-hmm. was super uncool, didn't fit in and I think for people like us who come to a community like this and do something that's very much coming from ourselves. Right. Like it's a self-directed thing. It's not because society told mm-hmm. us to come to Vilcabamba mm-hmm. and live in this hippie retirement village and, <laughs> and bottle water and make compost and do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, it's very much coming from our deeper callings and you know who we are as souls on a deeper level came here mm-hmm. to do this and to be who we are. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it was a blessing that I didn't really fit in in high school, that I wasn't popular, that mm-hmm. I had no success with girls, because it, it allowed me to ripen later and to ripen into something, I think, yeah. richer. I find that, you know, if you have, I call it the late bloomer syndrome, um, if, you, if you kind of have that, those kind of rejections or that sense of inferiority really sort of creates a pressure cooker mm-hmm. for you to really explode in growth in the later parts of your life. If you so choose to look at it that way, again, it's all just how you redirect energy. Yeah. You can self-destruct or you can thrive. And a lot of people don't get there. Honestly, if I didn't get the opportunity with Survivor, I think I wouldn't have gotten there. Mm-hmm. I think my life would have been <laughs> really sad. Mm-hmm. If I hadn't been on Survivor, mm-hmm. I think I would have continued just identifying as a loser mm-hmm. and gone deeper into darker and darker places of all those rabbit holes continue to not have any success Mm -hmm. with women or friendship or whatever. Mm -hmm. And because I was on Survivor, I was able to put that on the dating apps and see my matches go up tenfold or a hundredfold and whatever, and then see how superficial it is. Mm -hmm. Like, it's funny how the thing you Mm -hmm. glamorize as the mountain loses all its appeal after you summit it. Yeah. Like, you, you accomplish something, you have some experiences, and then you're like, okay, I experienced that. It actually didn't make me happy in the way I thought it would, Mm -hmm. never does. The happiness isn't outside, it's inside. That's yeah. why those inward times of the journey are so important. Mm-hmm. But you think it will. And when I was trying to get on Survivor, I thought, oh, if I get on this show, like, I don't even have to worry. Like, if I get on this show, my life is set. That would be such a huge win. Mm-hmm. I don't even, I'm not even going to calculate past that. I'm not even going to think beyond that dream. Because if I do that, that would be great. And it was great. I do think it was the difference between a 
depressing life track than an inspiring life track, but at the same time, it only was the path to the inspiring life track because I let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a really powerful quote that my sensei told me one time that sort of touches on that, which is, uh, my sensei is really amazing. He was a Danish national champion, like four black belts, amazing, amazing guy. Yeah. Very dear called him sensei. I call him sensei. Yeah. I think I also call him Josh, but. Gotta, gotta call him sensei. I mean, that's what it is. It's my sensei. Um, but he told me this one story that was really powerful that I think about a lot. And he said that when people get a black belt, most black belts get it wrong. They get a black belt and they stop and then they start teaching what they know. But he said the point of getting a black belt is to get a black belt and throw it away. Because now, now when you have a black belt, you actually have the foundations of how to go through life. Now you have the tools to explore the unexplored. You have the tools to develop the space that most people don't know how to explore. And that true mastery comes when you throw away what you think that you know and just enter into the mystery. Doesn't mean you throw away your skills. Doesn't mean because you're gonna have those skills. Mm -hmm. Another way to look at it is like playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. If you know all the scales and all the modes and all the chord inversions and jazz theory and all that stuff, you can learn it and figure it out and just in your sleep know exactly where it is on a guitar. But the second you step into that creative flow and everybody's vibing together and then you just let it rip, that's where the real magic unfolds. Mm -hmm. You throw the black belt away, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And that kind of reminds me of what you were telling me earlier. I mean, in your own experience, then you got to a certain level of inner mastery and then he threw it away and realized that I, I've always had it there. I've always had it right there. Yeah. 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 So with that being said, can you tell me a little more about your docuseries for those that haven't been following what you're doing or what you plan to do with this docuseries? What goals do you plan to accomplish with this? Yeah, it's a big vision and a long-term project. So it's going to be months before I'm releasing episodes, but it's also a multifaceted thing. It's like a mountain. And at the top of the mountain will be the docu-series episodes that are the most visible that go, I hope, around the world. Mm -hmm. And then at the bottom will be like the newer version of Joe Rogan Experience. I'll be doing interviews like this, although I'll be doing the interviews. Mm -hmm. I'll need a little more energy for that. But I'll be doing interviews and multiple interviews a week. And people who are really invested and loving it can follow along and, mm -hmm. and watch all of that. But then for people who are less invested or who we want to reach, the docu-series will be a way to share a possibility, a vision, a way of life with the world. <laughs> it's called Light and Shadows. So it's about sharing the light, the possibility of a place like this, of people creating alternative lifestyles, creating communities, working with medicines, healing, growing their own food, supporting biodiversity, coming together, love. It's sharing all of that while also sharing the shadows that will inevitably come. And we're living with a lot of them now as military are in the streets in Ecuador. Um, but a lot more will come and probably come actually for what we're co-creating here and for what I'm creating because I'm sure there are forces in this world that don't want an empowered, free, awake humanity, mm -hmm. which I'm supporting. Mm -hmm. So it's about sharing those issues, those challenges, the shadows, and sharing the light, and uh, sharing both sides of a lot of things that are often treated one-sidedly, like plant medicine, so many documentaries, so many things just show only the light. And there's a very dark side to plant medicine that I've experienced and encountered. And so... So you plan to go deeper with the indigenous wisdom around that? I do. I'm, I'm still honestly weighing um, my place in that, and, and I'm leaning toward not drinking much more medicine myself. I've drunk a lot of medicine. For a while, it seemed like my path was revolving around medicine, but now I feel it's much more powerful to go to those places and have non-entheogen psychedelic experiences and just connect to source and consciousness on our own power. So that's my focus now, but I do want to share that world and both its light and shadows, because so often it's just lionized and treated yeah. as a panacea. Yeah. And we do need to look at things realistically. Places like this also, like I love this place. I've found home, I've found myself here, and yet there are some, uh, some crazy people. You know, that has to stop. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's good to stop. Uh, eventually, plant medicine just becomes a poison. And then at that point, uh, when you stop, the indigenous tribe is spoken. <laughs> You know, I haven't thrown it in there, bro. 
spoken. Yeah, yeah, they've spoken. I mean, I think it always depends on the relationship. I think you can have a healthy, ongoing relationship with it. It doesn't matter if it become a poison. Yeah. But insofar as you believe you're sick and you need it to be well, it is disempowering. Totally. Yeah, most definitely. Well, it's a very exciting and inspiring vision um, that you have going on. And I think a lot of people here, when they really start to do the inner work, or people that just do the inner work in general, where they don't get trapped in what I call this spiritual hypochondria, hypochondriac. <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, I'm, I need medicine, I'm sick. I'm so like, dumb. no, you're not sick, you don't need medicine, you need to cut your hair and get a job. <laughs> like, that's what you can actually I can't go to the gym, just everything in the collective. <laughs> I, can't, I can't lift weights. <laughs> in fact, yeah, no, it's, it's pathetic. And yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, I, gotta, I gotta give credit where credit's due. It's a step in the right direction. Yeah, and the desiring to heal, desiring to integrate, desiring to overcome. But at a certain point on the other end, the through the hero's journey, we have to step into our authentic selves and be the change that we want to see in the world. But to take it even a step further, and this is, this is the key that a lot of people miss, is knowing that it's not about what you do, it's about what is being done through you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because then you become the vessel for change rather than you trying to think that you're the change yourself. And that's where another level of ego comes in. It's like, oh, I'm creating these big changes. Oh, I'm doing these amazing things. And it's like, well, yeah, but also like you're getting the inspiration from a higher power to do that. Yeah. You know, yeah, not that. <laughs> well, I, mean, I fall into it too, you know? Yeah. And I feel like anybody that comes to this other layer of empowered awakening and, and a desire to serve can fall into that trap. It's like, it's like the hero complex. It's like, yeah. and, um, and that's just another layer. It's another layer of the journey. It's starting. Mm -hmm. If anything, you can, you can be glad that you have decided to take the higher path of letting yourself be used for a higher purpose rather than one's only ego of desires. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary, man. It's, uh, there are a lot of layers of ego, still many layers of ego to go through, a lot of ego, and yeah. so many tricks and so much resistance to, to serving in heaven. Mm -hmm. We want to reign in hell. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm so glad I've walked that path. And, and I think it's cool to fall into the traps. Like you could look yeah. at survivors, me falling in a trap and acting out my id, but it was a beautiful part of my growth. Mm -hmm. And having a hero complex for a minute could mm -hmm. be also, we are all heroes and we're all nothing. Yeah. And if we can know both and have fun with the heroism without taking it too seriously, mm -hmm. great. Like I'm always looking for the balance. And so I've learned I'm nothing. I've deconstructed my ego. I'm also reconstructing a healthy ego that can channel this healthy masculine energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, it's just about having both forms of wisdom and both forms of power and integrating them together. I know I'm nothing and I also know I'm a pretty fucking cool guy, but sure. I also know it's not me, things coming through me. Yeah. And the scale of the things coming through me and the number of people, the right people showing up and just how serendipitous and synchronistic it's mm -hmm. been has been all the proof I need that it's not me. I mean, I've just been dragged kicking and screaming by spirit yeah. to do yeah. what I'm doing. So. So yeah, I'm deeply humbled at this point, and I'm re-embodying some of my power, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I want to have some swagger with the power that I have, yep. and know that I'm nothing. Both can coexist. It takes, it takes time. Um, as I was mentioning what that sensei said earlier, he said another really great one on air, because um, I, would, I would praise him a lot for a lot of the things that he taught me and the things he helped me with, and I would tell him, like, you've been such an important part of my journey and my growth and my life, and he would say, thank you, but really all the praise to us to the divine. Because I feel like at a certain point in one's journey, we really have to face ourselves and say, I need to own any of this. And none of this, and none of this with me. Mm -hmm. I'm just acting as a conduit for it. Yeah. And for me personally, the things that I've experienced in myself is like the second I think it's me, the second I'm thinking about myself, the second I do any of that is the second I get ripped out from under me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just I've gone through that enough to know that it's like don't even think about it. <laughs> don't even think that it's you. And, well, and you are the vessel, though. We well, yeah, are. You think you're the vessel, and you can honor yourself by doing the work to become that. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think that that's the, the happy medium mm -hmm. is that we can give ourselves credit for the, the, the self sacrifice of oneself because sacrificing our ego and everything that we think we need to know about everything that we think that we are, and just constantly reminding ourselves that no, like there's so much more, you can be better, 
that it's not about you. And constantly giving back to that state takes work. Like that was hard. And, and I do give myself credit for that. I do give myself credit for the, the struggle that I've gone through. Like yeah. deep humility. And I'm sure you've felt the same way too about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good, man, because you are a good interviewer. You have so much to give and offer this world. And I think it's healthy to have a healthy ego and to, to just appreciate yourself. Yeah. Well, I said the same to you, man. I, I think that part of the reason why we resonated with each other is because we are seeking a higher path. And, um, and that's why we, we want to make this kind of content to inspire other people that think the same way. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to rip off this, this talk now, but if... On that note, no, don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> don't leave. <laughs> the tribe has spoken. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, so le leaving that, leaving with that idea of leading with your highest authenticity and, and going for the ringer and going through the hero's journey, what are some suggestions in your personal path that you found for other people that are either starting that or feeling called to start that or have been on it for a while? To start the hero's journey? Well, to start the healing journey, the to, healing journey. To, to recognize that the faults of oneself and to face themselves and to go through the fire of transformation and to, and to rise up to be a better, humble servant. Yeah. I think if I can only say one thing, it's awareness. Mm. That's the most fundamental thing because everything stems from that. Change stems from the awareness that there's change to be done, to be experienced, and then it flows really naturally once you get clear on that. Mm -hmm. But awareness, feeling it all, feeling the bad things, knowing that the bad feelings and the shame and all of that is really just a form of love teaching you to grow. Mm -hmm. everything's a form of love teaching you to grow and that's why you can't get attached to one teacher mm -hmm. the bad things in your life the problems are teaching you and the good things are teaching you and you can learn from both and not attach to either so in that stillness feeling it all being with it all being grateful for it all as your teacher because life is one big psychedelic medicinal mm -hmm. trip that's it's what trip. we're for we're learning the trip and so being still and feeling it all and being there for it and then being very clear about where you want to go as far as this feminine stillness and masculine movements go and in so far as they complement each other get really clear on what you want and why like i knew i wanted to be on survivor and i did it and it was a huge learning of my power to manifest very empowering but I didn't really know why I was very unconscious. And that was fine for the time. But as much as you can be clear on the why, you're clear on where you're going. And uh, it's your experience of life. That's why we need that energy of movement. We could all just be yogis sitting there receiving what life gives us. There's nothing wrong with that, but we're here to live our life. And so you get to decide what that is. And by feeling it all and being aware, you can see why it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you're very clear in where you're moving. Powerful. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, this was one of my most enjoyable interviews I've done. I feel the same way, man. Thank you guys for coming on the interview. I had a really enjoyable time talking to Mr. Spencer over here. Yeah. So. Ryman. Ryman. <laughs> <laughs> he goes by Ryman now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Ryman Spencer. Yeah. Why, why did you? Why did you change your name again? Uh, did oh, yeah. yeah. We we didn't do that part of the interview. No, no, we weren't calling <laughs> or mention that. Yeah. But I had an ayahuasca retreat and I died and I was reborn and then I felt just intuitively I wanted to change it. It felt connected to my family. It sounded good when I said it and mm -hmm. felt better. I think a silver lining and an added benefit is that it removes me a little bit from the TV identity, but that's not like the, the reason I did it. Really just because it feels right. Okay. Good. Right. good. Awesome. For now. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see if I change again. Yeah. So thank you guys so much. Um, when Ryman releases his documentaries, you can check those out. They're going to be amazing. And you can follow me on my YouTube channel. The links will be uh, below. I work a lot with masculine development and cultivation, and as well as helping you with relationships and just overall becoming the best man that you can be on the world and interviewing people that are really interesting that are going through their own personal healing journey to come into their fullest, most authentic power. So thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Listen, if you're new to this channel or you've been following me for a while, you're probably the kind of person that knows that they're meant for much, much greater things in their life.
and while most people are not living up to their fullest potential and would rather live in mediocrity for the rest of their lives, never really doing anything noteworthy or anything that they can ever really say that they're proud of, you know that you're different. You know deep down inside that your life is meant to be invigorating and exciting. You know that you're meant to have amazing, loving, inspirational people that support you. You know that you're meant to have unique and exciting and enlivening experiences. And you know that you're meant to have a career that's totally aligned with service and abundance and something that really, really lights your jets. Now, when you hear this, you know deep down inside that this is actually for you but perhaps maybe you don't know where to go or where to turn. If you're really, really serious about getting super clear and getting the practical steps on how to actually make this reality happen for you, click the link in the bio and I'll show you how. I'll see you there.